we are live now. Please go ahead. Welcoming you uh, to another series of webinars in the series of illness to wellness. Today we have a very, very important topic that is the rising burden of non communicable diseases in India. And we have a star galaxy of specialists who are going to uh, who are going to give us a very important information about non communicable diseases and today is a very special day because we would be coming about coming up with some very new and latest information about the non communicable diseases about their prevalence in India. So let us start with a very small introduction of non communicable diseases. In the earlier times, let's say not very far away, a few decades back, the major cause of death and suffering in our country used to be the uh, the communicable diseases, the infectious diseases like tuberculosis, diarrhea, but a lot has changed since then. Medical facilities have become better, sanitation has improved, people are more educated, more aware, and the country has progressed economically. And with the economic progress, with the migration, with the stress, have come many diseases, the diseases of the modern times. The pandemic of modern times, those are the lifestyle diseases and everything associated with. It. So these diseases like uh, the diseases of the heart, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, respiratory diseases. These are the diseases which are called non communicable because they are not infectious yet they are there and they form the major burden of death in our country and all over the world. So we can say that about 60 to 70 percent of people die prematurely between 30 to 70 years of age because of the non-communicable disease country and in Asia. So once again, welcome to all of you in this session of illness prevention series, the rising burden of non-communicable disease in India. To address us and to help us and to guide us, we have. Uh, we have a galaxy of specialists from all over the country and they are known to each and every one of them. They don't need any introduction, but still I would uh, give a small introduction of everyone. Padm Bhushan Professor Dr. Shiv Kumar Sareen, Head of Department of Hepatology and Director, Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences, New Delhi. Welcome, sir. Padm Bhushan Dr. K.K. Talwar, Chairman, PSRI Heart Institute, former head of department cardiology or Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi and director, postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh. We have with us uh, Padma Bhushan, Dr. Amrish Mittal, chairman and head endocrinology and diabetes department, Max Healthcare, Pan Max Hospital. Welcome, sir. We have with us uh, Professor Dr. Rajinder K. Dhamija, head of department of neurology, Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. Welcome, sir. And uh, I think uh, shortly joining would be Dr. G.C. Khilani. He is the ex head and professor, Department of Pulmonary Medicine and Sleep Disorders, or Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. And he is currently the chairman, PSRI Institute of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. Also, we have with us Dr. Shikha Halder. She is the director and a senior consultant in Department of Radiation Oncology, BLK Max Super Specialty Hospital. So welcome once again to all of you, sir. When we started thinking about this topic and discussing how to go on further, I was reminded of a speech which I heard uh, from uh, from one of the eminent freedom fighters, veteran politician, Dr. Deesh Narayan. He was talking about his childhood, how he developed, and he said that when he was very small, his father told him to remember things which are going to help him throughout the life. And he said just three words, nothing else, which I have been following till yet. And those were Ahar, Javhar, and Vayam. And I think a lack of these maybe is the reason why we are progressing towards this pandemic of non-communicable diseases. So my request to each one of you would be, sir and madam, that please 
please take few words give your opinion about the non communicable diseases about their importance uh, and so that we can move ahead with our program i would like to request uh, dr amrish patel to start sir yeah am i audible yes sir yes sir. yes yes yeah it's a pleasure to join uh, such a galaxy of specialists and friends uh, to talk about ncd of course which is the main theme of our lives actually uh, we realize that uh, in in my field that is uh, the field of endocrinology we realize that there are other ncds but the overpowering one is is diabetes and we do realize the uh, impact of diabetes there's no no educated indian now who can say he's not aware of diabetes or the fact that diabetes has increased exponentially in this country uh, there is uh, so there are two aspects to this one will be one will be the fact that how has diabetes grown in india uh, and why and second would be it's in the context of the pandemic that we are all facing right so the first of course we all know that diabetes has increased exponentially uh, professor talwar is here we are aware that in 1970 when professor hoja did the first proper epidemiological study in urban india the prevalence was 2. Point something 2.1% or something in urban india and now we also know that in urban india it varies between 10 and 20% in metros it may actually be even higher than 20% if you take in the city of delhi if you uh, cross sectionally screen people at 40 like in the population you will find that diabetes prevalence is close to 20% at 40 and if you reach 60 then that figure might well be closer to 35 or 40% this is all published data so so i mean this is uh, staggering uh, these are numbers are staggering it has grown exponentially we won't go too much into the uh, reasons but we all know it's lifestyle related related to diet exercise sleep patterns stress etc <coughs> similar to your figures have come out from your own study that you recently shared with us the rise has been exponential excuse me so the important parts here are that it's grown in urban as well as rural but there is a clear urban rural divide overall it's always higher in urban areas right and the growth has also been faster in urban areas interestingly in the indiab icmr study it is the more economically developed regions that have seen a greater increase in diabetes so the highest prevalence of diabetes is found in the most flourishing areas so like chandigarh for example is a, a delhi the metros you know they have they have much higher diabetes than let's say jharkhand where or, or odisha because what happens is that in those in those states or in those regions where economic development is now taking place there the city and uh, village divide is very high and you find that in the cities the it's much much more whereas in the rural areas of these uh, states it's it's relatively much less diabetes so it is linked unfortunately in a way to economic development to urbanization now within the metros now we think we used to be taught it's a rich man's disease within larger cities actually it's increasingly more common in the lower socio economic strata because they are consuming the same kind of diets and even more unhealthy diets and unhealthy practices so within within the 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 urban canvas it is the lower socio economic strata that is more affected in the rural areas it's clearly the higher socio economic strata that is more affected so there are lots of things happening there and we won't labor this point but there is a explosion there is no question and it is preventable because the genes are the same but when you move from a village to a small town your risk of diabetes doubles you move from a small town to a metro it doubles again so from the village the the, the, the your workers and others who migrate from the village to live in the city in large cities their risk of diabetes goes up 3 to 4 fold so that is one part of course we know diabetes is not just diabetes it's related with heart disease with with liver with kidney and all those issues that's of course hypertension as you yourself have shown in the study is the most uh, sort of 
important and most closely related partner in crime to diabetes, probably even more prevalent than diabetes itself. The last uh, one or two minutes, I will just talk a little bit about the pandemic scenario. The fact that in this pandemic, this has further been brought to light from the very first study from Wuhan, it has been shown that people with diabetes have poorer outcomes when, when uh, exposed to COVID. And that has been borne out by our own study of more than 400 people in our hospital, the MAX, where we, which we published in December, where we showed that people who came in with diabetes, uh, uncontrolled diabetes specifically, had much poorer outcomes in sense, more ICU stay, more oxygen requirement, more steroid usage, and more mortality. And this was in particular true of those who had multiple comorbidities. If you have just clean diabetes and you're a young person, you probably can get by. But if you're an older person with diabetes, with hypertension, with some element of heart disease, with chronic kidney disease, your prognosis is very poor. In our study, in 15 out of 401 people who, who died in that study, 13 had hypertension and diabetes. So you can see that this is a, a very, very important area. And if you have to, as I say, to conclude that basically this pandemic is not just about the virus, it's also or spread, which is the most important thing, of course. But it is also about reducing the number of vulnerable people. So if you imagine a population where the diabetes and hypertension prevalence is 5% and, and corona spreads there, versus a population where diabetes hypertension prevalence is 25% and, and corona spreads there. So the, 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 the amount of healthcare services required, the morbidity, hospitalization, ICU requirement, and mortality will all be much higher in people with comorbidities in the 25% uh, group. So therefore, emphasizing that if you want to brace yourself to face these kind of pandemics in the future, which we never know, if this one is not gone yet, but even future, we the fact is that we will have to focus on NCDs. We will have to focus on bringing them down. Otherwise, we are sitting ducks for all the viruses to come and you know, affect us and uh, population is so vulnerable. I think I will stop here and let uh, the others, including my seniors, have a say, and then we'll come back. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Dr. Talwar, sir, what would you like to say about <laughs> CDs? Aap kya bolna chahiye? Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm audible, Rajesh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You see, uh, non communicable diseases. Anyway, these are the lifestyle related disorders. And uh, most of the risk factor, I think, are common to these diseases, whether it's a diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, stroke, and to some extent, cancer. That's why I say these are lifestyle related disorders. And of course, um, uh, we know that they can be prevented, they can be treated. And that's the major that if you know them, I mean, you can try to take steps to prevent these diseases to a reasonable extent. And at the same time, you can also treat most of them properly if you sort of are careful. And uh, so that's the two. Number second factor, I think we also know that though it was earlier thought of in 70s, 80s, that is a rich man's disease. I think we know Dr. Mittal also emphasized no more there. It is more now in the low and middle income countries. The load of non communicable is much more in these countries because I think people in richer countries have come to know about it and they are taking preventive steps more effectively to reduce this uh, burden. I think the fourth factor in my sort of, as you mentioned, Dr. B. N. Singh's name. I mean, um, that uh, he mentioned three factors, that four things, because I mean, I just mentioned his name because I happen to know him very closely. So I think one is the diet. We all know that unbalanced diet or unhealthy diet is a major risk factor. Exercise, lack of exercise is another risk factor. I think behavior, your behavior, your attitude to life. So like uh, smoking, uh, alcohol, your own habits, uh, even I will uh, uh, sort of extend to say there are even studies people who have a more like a they say cunning kind of attitude, maybe more prone to non-communicable diseases. 
I'm just, <laughs> this is a study came from Israel. So, and then of course, genetics also has some role to play, particularly, I mean, most of these uh, situations. And that's why you say that these, this is also like epigenetics. That you have a genetic cause sometimes preponderance, and then you have an environmental factor which aggravated. So I think if you take care of the environment or whatever other risk factor, you can tremendously reduce the load, and as well as also so, sort of uh, so uh, say. And we also know that the mortality is also young people are high in non-communicable diseases. And of course, I think as far as the low and middle income countries like us. We are even going through a double burden. We have a non-communicable disease burden which has come. We also still are suffering from communicable disease burden. So we have a double load kind of a disease disorders. We, as far as in two diseases in my particular field, like uh, hypertension and coronary heart disease, hypertension you know is uh, uh, probably one in four, as you also mentioned in male, and one in five in female or hypertensive. Even below the age of around 49, 50, you will see that around 11, 12% patients are hypertensive. But when you go beyond that age, it's around 30, 40%. I think in Punjab, there was a recent two years back a survey, 50% people were hypertensive. So I think hypertension is a huge load. And the other two things are people are not aware of it because it's a more or like a silent disease. Unless you record, you may not know that you are hypertensive. And uh, so it's a treatable. And other factor is that also it has to be optimally treated. We also know that only 25 to 30 percent people are optimally under control. The rest of them may be taking medicine, but they are not optimally controlled. So that's one issue that we should address to always how to because the drugs are not very expensive, and so people can sort of take care of the blood pressure. And the other thing, if I have to mention about the coronary artery disease, I think uh, the prevalence again has risen over the last few some decades. I remember it was like three, four percent. Now it has gone to ten, nine to twelve, eleven percent kind of thing. Is on. But I must also admit that the survey in our countries are limited, larger survey. Uh, one fact, I'm of course the risk factors are almost common as I mentioned, and uh, uh, if the diabetes is uh, much more commoner, I am sure the coronary artery disease is going to follow. Because mostly diabetic, uh, sort of, if you look at the metabolic risk factor, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and then uh, hypertension, I mean, these are certain factor apart from the behavioral factor which make you to more prone to get coronary artery disease. And one factor that I think we must also realize is that coronary artery disease is more common in younger people in our country as compared to the Western population. It is much severer at a much younger age. They say 10 to 15 years earlier than probably in those populations. We are not very clear the reason for it, uh, but possibly there are certain factors which makes uh, more people prone to coronary artery disease in the younger people is smoking. And this is some of the studies done from our own institution center. Now, smoking is the commonest risk factor in people with the uh, in younger people. We had a, around 100 cases that we analyzed in PGI. I'm talking about more than now 15 years back. 100 young, 35 below age, acute coronary event, and more than 80% were smokers. So I think that is a very important risk factor. We need to sort of make effort that we can. Uh, so I will say that this is a one disease which is preventable, treatable, and uh, risk factors are common to many of these non-communicable diseases, and a strategy, effort, in a combined manner can reduce the burden of even cancer also, uh, have some kind of a, a certain lifestyle disorders can also lead to cancer. So I think with these words, I'd like to thank you so much again for this opportunity, and thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Thank you so much once again. And I think you mentioned a very, very important point that these diseases are preventable. Even though treatment is there, it is not that relatively costly. It is cheap, accessible. Just as in diabetes, hardly 30% of people are controlled. Uh, thank you, sir. I'd like to come to Dr. Dhanija, sir. What, are, what is your opinion about NCDs in your field especially? 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you very much for having me in this webinar. As usual, this is my fourth webinar with the SHM. And it's always a pleasure to be part of this August uh, panel, uh, which you always uh, assemble. So it's a pleasure to be with Professor Talwar, sitting with Professor uh, Ambrish Mittal, and uh, talking about non-communicable diseases, uh, the struggles of the, the uh, in their professional lives. <laughs> So coming to uh, neurological aspects of non-communicable disease, as you know, uh, today is a World Brain Day, 22nd of July. Uh, all over the world, this is being observed to create awareness uh, about the brain diseases. And uh, we are also having few programs, and uh, I'm proud to be part of this. Uh, this is also a part of awareness campaign. So right from my MD, med Medicine and DM, I have been doing epidemiological studies of uh, stroke, which I did my as MD thesis in uh, Haryana at Gortak district, which we surveyed door to door survey in a 51,000 population in a Deagle PHC, which is attached to the Rotak Medical College. So we found the prevalence at that time was 50 per 100,000. And then I followed it up with my DM, uh, again, acute uh, statement of stroke. And now after 30 years, the prevalence has gone four times. So you can imagine the, the trajectory of the stroke alone, uh, in addition to the other non-communicable diseases happening in the last 30 years. The main uh, factors responsible for these, number one, uh, as everybody has mentioned, uh, the, the lifestyle. But on top of that, we are a changing economy. So there is a demographic transition of our population. The longevity has increased. Now we have aging population. If you think, uh, if you go back in 1970, the life expectancy of India was around 47 years. And now in 2020, it is around 70 years. So we have a cohort of geriatric population, and that makes more chances of having uh, neurodegenerative diseases, vascular diseases like stroke, and other neurological illnesses like motor neuron disease and dementia. So one factor which is very crucial is that we have to understand the demography of our population, which is aging. So number two is most of the developed countries are now seeing decline in mortality as well as incidence and prevalence of stroke. While in our country and other low middle income countries are resource poor countries, we are witnessing rise in the prevalence and incidence of uh, vascular disease, particularly stroke. So that is a very peculiar phenomena happening in low and middle income country because of the rising epidemic of, epidemic of lifestyle disease like diabetes and hypertension, and on top of that, our aging population. Lack of physical activity is another factor which we have to consider, as well as the air pollution. So all these factors have been brought out in your uh, report, which you, you are uh, launching today. And I'm glad to see the, the, the effort being made by SHM to create uh, the awareness, as well as to sens sensitize the public or the policy makers to look for these because all of them, all of these diseases are preventable and there are treatment gaps, whether you take it stroke, which only 10% of the eligible people, uh, eligible patients get thrombolized in the golden hour of uh, golden window of four and a half hours. So that is where we have to work upon. Uh, I have been writing in the Hindustan Times and other uh, newspapers regarding the strengthening of district health system. So our district hospitals, which were glory in the past, has now not uh, uh, grown up with the time or which have not maintained the pace with the technology. So we need to upgrade those hospitals with all districts, all the 700 districts must have a CT scanner and must have a basic treatment uh, for the stroke. So these are very, very important things. Now coming to, I, I would just need a little bit touch upon the, the numbers in terms of neurological diseases in India. So last week, the Global Burden of Disease study came up in Lancet Global Health, which is a joint venture of, this study was a joint venture of ICMR, Public Health Foundation of India with Dr. K. Sinath Reddy, which I have been associated with since my MD days. And that has now come up with 10% of the total disease burden in India is because of the neurological diseases. And it has doubled up in last 30 years from 1990 to 2019. So that are the numbers which are really, really alarming. We are having 1.3 million new stroke cases every year in India, out of which we are losing about 7 lakh people to stroke another 6 lakh people with disability or, uh, or the handicap are added to the community uh, where we have to rehabilitate them and we have to look after them. There are about 
one crore people who are having epilepsy and epilepsy is again uh, because of the communicable as well as non communicable factors whether it is genetic or otherwise again we have 7 lakh people uh, of parkinson disease we have around 50000 people of motor neuron disease so they are all huge numbers and in a growing population which we are having now towards the the aging numbers so obviously we have to plan uh, make policies to look after these patients and that's that's where we must focus on in um, in coming years so once again i thank you once uh, for all of you and greetings for the world brain day and from the lady harding medical college thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much dr neeja I'd like to request Dr. Shekha Haldar to say a few words about NCDs as an oncologist. The microphone is muted, ma'am. Please unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Um, yeah, from oncology pros uh, uh, prospect of view, is that like we, we all know that cancer has been increasing uh, steadily. When you sorry, so at the beginning of twentieth century, we saw there were there were hardly any cancer cases. Um, the uh, but by the time we came to twentieth century, it is one of the second most common. Uh, uh, NCD to cause mortality. The, uh, the percentage of mortality is 9% uh, contributing to the NCD. So if you see the data of Tata Memorial Hospital, uh, of Tata Memorial Hospital from 1964 to, to 2020, the cancer has increased by 20-folds, uh, sorry, 4-folds. And the, the etiology is, uh, you know, one is the, is what is aging. Most of us, it is uh, the etiology is mostly genetics, whether it is environmental or increase in age. So, uh, since the beginning of century, the uh, the uh, life expectancy expectancy was around twenty five years. So then, at that time, the number of cases per million were about twelve. Now, when we see about in twenty twenty, it's around four thousand per million uh, population. So there is a huge leap in uh, cancer. Uh, cases but the other factors are also lifestyle like tobacco is the biggest uh, killer for uh, uh, in, in oncology and the commonest cancer is lung cancer followed by uh, tongue cancer then we have breast and uh, uterine cancer here i have to point out uterine cancer was used to be commonest in india but with the change of lifestyle, the breast cancer has become more common than uterine cancer. And of course, after that, stomach. But if you see whole India, there is a huge difference in type of cancer. The highest incidence of cancer is in the Northeast, followed by uh, North India, then Southern India, and the we have two registry. We have two types of registry. One is hospital-based registry. One is population-based registries. So the population-based registry, which is in one is in B, then Somanabad, they show the lowest uh, number of cases. But one we so we have to really look into. So the environment plays a biggest role in causing the type of cancer. You see, when we uh, go across India, lung is the most commonest, commonest. But when you go to northeast. There, uh, the um, head and neck is the most uh, uh, head and neck is most common, followed by stomach. In southern India, again, following lung cancer, it is the stomach which is uh, more prevalent. So it is the I think the diet or the uh, environment, uh, the lifestyle which they are following, uh, is the more uh, is the most uh, causative factors in this uh, getting this cancer. And moreover, another thing is now it is more number of cases are being more diagnosed. People are have access to a uh, medical system and people are more aware and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the women uh, have, there is a lot of change in women uh, prospects, like they have started working, having less children and uh, uh, using, uh, you know, obesity is another problem. So these are all contributory factor for breast cancers. That is how the uh, the change from uterine cancer in females, have, uh, the breast cancer has increased in uh, women. So what I'll, I can say there is the prevention from prevention point of view, 
the 20 to 30 percent of all cancers are caused by uh, tobacco. So if you have strict rule for tobacco use, I think uh, many of the cancer can be controlled. Another this thing is another point is that like uh, 70 percent of the cancer can be pre uh, you know potentially preventable if we use um, if we change our lifestyle, you use a uh, low fat diet, use exercises, be fit, and um, uh, and uh, you know low uh, alcohol consumption uh, you know less alcohol comes your consumption and there are certain uh, infective cancer like uterine cancers and stomach cancer if we improve the personal hygiene we can reduce this cancer so this is what i can say like uh, i think we have to be more vigilant and uh, screening of cancer is very very important especially the infective types and uh, in, at present in India, we do not have any proper screening uh, system, but in an individual basis, one should undergo at least a uh, health check time to time. And for uh, for breast cancer, especially since it is increasing, uh, you know, clinical breast examination, if not a mammogram, a clinical breast examination is very, very important. And I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Time. Thank you so much, Dr. Shikha. And uh, now I'd like to invite Dr. S.K. Sarin, he's also present with us. Dr. Sarin, sir, if you can hear me, would you please uh, share your opinion and your views about NCDs? Am I audible, sir? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Asocham and Rajesh, for inviting me. It is a coincidence that 22nd July is a very important day. 22nd of February, the government of India included NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, into the NCD program. And in fact, India became the first country in the world to have fatty liver disease as a part of the NCD. So with all respect to my very dear colleagues uh, from other branches, I just want to say we are new entrants, but maybe uh, I would like to share with you some basic concepts which I think might be worthwhile why liver holds the key. Uh, normally, all organs should have less than 5% of the fat in them. In liver, if there is more than 10% fat, you call it fatty liver. So what is the relevance? If the liver cell has fat, the insulin is unable to get inside and get the sugars burned and utilized. So pancreas will keep on making more and more insulin if there is fat in the liver, gradually you will exhaust your pancreas. It may be too simple, but it's just to say that sugar control is guarded by liver, pancreas produces it. Second, if you have extra fat, it goes into your arteries, it goes into the heart. So when you do a blood test and you say, oh, he has high triglyceride, he has high cholesterol, it means your liver already has ample of triglyceride or cholesterol, which is now in the blood as circulating lipids. Similarly, you have a marker of inflammation coming from liver. That marker is called SGPT or ALT. It's a 20 rupees test. So if you have a high SGPT, Normal in India is considered as 40, but many countries take it lower. So let's say if you have a high SGPT and you are 26 years old, the chance of first heart attack at 36 is seven times higher. It means this is a famous Candavian Hoorn study that a SGPT correlates with a heart disease 10 years ahead. Similarly, the famous Framingham studies, we all are aware of these major US studies. So if a young boy has 
an SGPT, let's say of 80, two times or three times of normal, his chance of developing diabetes in next 10 years is five to 10 times more. So what I want to say is that understanding the fatty liver will make, Dr. Mittal said very rightly that 10, 20 and even higher percentage may have diabetes. Fatty liver is in 30% of the Indians or globally 30%. So if you have fat, some of you may develop diabetes, some may develop blood pressure, heart disease. Gallbladder stone, considered as a disease of gallbladder, is actually fat of the liver depositing into the gallbladder. Same is true for a stroke. Dr. Damija Saab said very well, the numbers are increasing. But the origin of inflammation starts, and that's why in 2020, the term non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has been proposed to be changed as MAFLD, metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. So understanding the excess of calories or type of calories is very vital for us. And SOHM, you all are chartered accountant or I mean accounts people, Energy intake and energy output must be balanced. But if you have extra income, unaccounted income, it goes to ectopic sites. Ectopic sites are liver, pancreas, heart, abdomen, blood vessels, and these ectopic sites create all diseases. So the NCD, non-communicable disease, actually can start from beginning. Say, for example, your muscle should not have fat more than 5%. But if you have 6 or 8% fat, you become insulin resistant. Insulin doesn't work. And you may lead to having cardiac events. Now the question is, can you change? I think the attempt by SOHM, SOHM has 8 letters and I find we are 8 people today. SOHM can actually make a difference and they have shown with very large studies. How can we change it? First, change your attitude. Don't say fatty liver hai, koi farak nahi padta hai, dekha jayega. Because you can actually avoid, prevent a disease coming 10 years later. So first is change in attitude. Change in attitude to NCDs also. Thoda sa BP hai, kya karenge sa? Rehne to dawai se jada khatar adarte hai, bimari se nahi. Diabetes, thoda sa sugar high hai, sab kya farak padta hai? So that change in attitude to positive health and preventive prevention of diseases is required, number one. Number two, we must realize that none of us spends as much time as required for exercise. 15 minutes of rigorous exercise can change utilization of glucose by the muscles. So SOTM can take up large marathons uh, actually every month and all of us would like to run in that. We should partner on these health initiatives. The third important part is avoiding the type of food and the time of food. You know, everything is in your plate. The size of plate, what you put into the plate and from the plate what gets into your body and your system makes all the difference. So if we are able to understand from the newborns, the very, very recent large studies say if you give fruit juice to a baby five times a day versus once in five days, you will delay development of fatty liver and coronary and other problems many, many times. I give another example. A 10-year-old child who is obese, his heart has worked as if the heart has lived for 40 years. So childhood obesity, change in our attitude in the schools and maybe in the mothers, and of course, preventive aspects rather than treatment aspects. I think I appreciate the efforts done by SOHM, but I also want we should be more Indians, have the incharya, our good values of food and, uh, you know, kate, charhara sharir hai, patla dubla hai. So today is the best day of the rest of your life. To make that happen, all preventive aspects should be done. People shouldn't die. One more point I would like to say, Dr. 
talwar had said young people who are not even overweight also have cardiac event and this is because of your bad adipose tissue your fat tissue if you eat and you are in the first generation your adipose tissue can become absorb the extra fat but not if you are late so the effect of environment and effect of genes there are three types of personalities you are the first generation your mother father never had heart disease stroke or diabetes or blood pressure you are okay but your grandchildren will suffer if you become overweight it takes that walking gene theory takes time but let's say your grandfather had diabetes your grandfather had hypertension liver disease liver cancer or cirrhosis you will certainly suffer much more even with small amount thoda sa khayenge pani bhi ghee ki tarah lagta hai this is the effect of genes that you inherit from others now coming to covid those people who had a bmi above 25 this is lancet endocrinology those who had a bmi above 25 had more severe disease but another very major paper in new england and others that if your liver has fat you have 6.4 times odds ratio which is more than the combined comorbidities which is 6.3 odds ratio means you have diabetes blood pressure blah blah even then you have a progressive disease or you have extra fat in the liver so that i want to uh, stress and the effect of vaccines may be less if you are diabetic if you are having obesity or have fat in the liver with this in mind this should be the first of the initiatives by all of us with the best experts possible around an sohm that we should move to a positive health with lean body height minus 100 should be your weight but if your parents have diabetes height minus 105 for males and females height minus 100 in centimeters lean and thin less of extra fat less of calories and of course timely sleep will make all the difference i congratulate sohm for this initiative and we would partner if you take all these health uh, preventive health strategies thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much dr sari you have very lucidly highlighted the role of liver the excess fat your theories about diabetes like the twin theory for the cause of diabetes and so many other diseases thank you so much now i'd like to move the ball forward and uh, as we have as all the our panelists have already talked a little bit about the study which has been done uh, by sohm together with hot arbitrage research institute this study covers more than 2 lakh people all over the country in 21 states and more than 630 or so health centers and it has studied the prevalence of non communicable disease which ones in which numbers and which are the worst affecting the population today and in the august presence of all the stalwarts and the galaxy of specialists which are present i would like to i would request each one of you to pick up a copy of this book uh, the report which you have bring it in front of you in the uh, in front of the camera so that we can display it and we can inaugurate it so if you have the book please bring it in front of the camera this is the report this is the report non communicable diseases in india It has been uh, made possible to bring this out. The joint efforts, obviously, of uh, Sachin, a pioneering organization in our country, and Kari, that is Hot Arbitrage Research Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would request uh, Mr. Kaushik Datta. He is the founder and co-director of Thought Arbitrage Research Institute, Kari, to uh, give us an introduction, a brief introduction about this report and what are the findings and what are the important uh, conclusions of this report. This study. Um. 
Good afternoon. Will someone actually give me access to share the presentation? Or I mean, I could just sure. actually, or I could just actually run you through the key highlights uh, uh, just by talking to you. Uh, I'm the only non physician or a doctor in this whole audience uh, in this whole panel. So what I'm going to tell you is uh, is facts and figures, which are numbers. Based on this survey, which Dr. Kesri was saying, is had 232 like 33,000 people, which is fairly large study, uh, large survey done by uh, the physical survey was done by Cantor. The data analysis and all the report writing and and the regression and the statistical models was done by us. Uh, some of the key things: the the cost of NCD in India currently is roughly about 3.55 trillion dollars. This is the estimate that was made by World Economic Forum and uh, Harvard and Harvard and Harvard University. Second thing I would say is that uh, what is the, the just the DALI, which is the disability adjusted life years. Every year we lose roughly about 280 million life years years due to <laughs> NCDs, which includes both death and also your yearly years of life adjusted with disease. That means if you live with a disease, you are not 100% healthy. So that with that progressive degeneration, that calculation together is roughly over 271 million years. So having said that, what are the other things? I mean, between 1990 to today, in it's 1990, the NCD-related deaths used to be 40%, now it's about 65%. That's about two thirds of the total deaths are NCD-related. And the second one is that among the disease burden, it is about 60% of the total disease burden of India. Uh, what are the key key things that actually are the main causes of disease? Uh, let, let's first look at a few other statistics, uh, a few other data. One is that like like all the all the all the doctors in this panel have said that it is actually becoming a young man's disease. Earlier it was thought to be uh, as you get older, but now the sharp turn in the disease prevalence actually starts from the age 35. From between age 35 and 65, it really accelerates and grows about four times. So, and, and there are a number of reasons for it, and we can we can all all discuss that on a later date. Uh, currently, the prevalence of NCDs is about 116 per thousand, which is fairly high. And second thing is that Orissa not. Odisha is the state which has got the highest amount of NCDs, which is about 272 per, per thousand population as compared to the Indian average of 116. And uh, surprisingly, Gujarat has got the lowest prevalence of 60. And Andhra Pradesh, Telangana and West Bengal have states with higher incidence than the national average. Uh, Northeast, like uh, Dr. Halda said, has got the highest prevalence of NCD, uh, despite being having a lower population and after that east has got the highest prevalence of ncd if you if you divide india as a geographical population geography uh, surprisingly on a gender uh, prevalence of ncds have been more or less similar i mean it's not that men or women actually have got a runaway difference but there are some some diseases like uh, females, according to this survey, has got higher hypertension and neurological. Uh, males have, are more prone to contracting NCDs, but about uh, than females, except for hypertension and neurological disorders, which are more prevalent among women. And uh, as a whole, there was there has been not been a significant difference between the NCD pattern or the nature of NCDs between urban and rural. These have there are some of some diseases which are more prevalent, but on on and over uh, overall, it's just, it's actually uh, it doesn't make a huge amount of urban rural mix. When it comes to comorbidity, and uh, there are lots of uh, all the all the doctors have talked about it, the highest amount of comorbidity is actually in hypertension, which actually cut across all the all the all the other. Uh, other NCDs, which include heart disease, cancer, diabetes, respiratory, hypertension, brain, neurological disorders, kidney, digestive. And after that is diabetes, which also has got the second highest level of comorbidities. When you see the report, it has got all the data points, uh, which actually is statistically derived from the data. And, and that, that's, 
That, that's about the comorbidity that I would like, I would say. And then what are the causes of prevalence of the risk factor causes? Uh, among the highest is air pollution. Then everyone talked about low physical uh, activities, which is, which is actually very close to air pollution. Uh, then obviously the other one that is coming out is, is the kind of food you eat. It's low, low diet of legume, high stress levels, uh, low diet of milk, uh, alcohol consumption, high body weight BMI, uh, pollution at workplace, low grain, uh, tobacco, alcohol, smoking. But these actually, uh, if you look at the chart, the prevalence is, and the, the prevalence that we have in the report is very similar to the prevalence that is uh, reported by the IHME, which is the ICMR and, and the World Bank, uh, and sorry, ICMR, ICMR and WHO related. And the other key thing that actually comes out of this report, apart from, you know, if you take, uh, I'll just run you for another minute. Uh, the heart diseases, in heart diseases, the highest amount of relative, uh, the correlation or the causality is, is, is high stress levels, which is about three times that of, you know, effects of intake of high cholesterol food, consumption of alcohol, tobacco, high obesity. Uh, obesity, overweight, physical. So stress and heart diseases have got the highest amount of correlation. In, when it comes to cancer, uh, it has got a correlation with low physical activity, obesity, overweight, consumption of tobacco, uh, and low intake of food, and, and air pollution. For respiratory diseases, obviously, uh, it, it's, it's air pollution, both indoor, outdoor, obesity, uh, consumption of tobacco, high consumption of tobacco, exposure to air pollution on road, uh, on hypertension, low physical activities, uh, high intake of food, junk food, and 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 fried food and sugar, sugar laden food, obesity. These are the top three causes. For diabetes, uh, it's intake of junk, fried, uh, sugar laden food, low physical activity, uh, low consumption of uh, fruit and vegetables, and uh, and the, and the diet. And then comes alcohol. Uh, the the key one of the key. Takeaways from this report, what we what we feel is that we are we don't actually spend enough on prevention of for for the diseases because when you look at the pattern of seeking medical attention and intervention, most of the there is there's three fourth of the people who who have NCDs actually drop out of of the treatment because this is not life threatening even in case of cancer. So, because of the 80%, over 75 to 80% of the medical expenses of an individual is private, and because there's a significant amount of poverty, especially in the rural areas, uh, people do not actually follow through the treatment. And that actually is uh, one of those things which, through a preventive mechanism, we can, we can stop. And the other thing is that it also the kind of food that we actually give, even in school and in the Akshep, in, in, in the uh, midday programs and all have got too much of carbohydrates and fat and not enough protein. So, so there are a number of these recommendations that are there in the report. It was a pleasure to actually work with Asachim and and with with all the doctors who actually uh, looked at our report and gave us comments and everyone else, Dr. Srivastava, who worked very very hard on the report and and has been a co-author with me. So, thank you very much. If you have any questions. Uh, uh, we'd be very happy to answer uh, later on. And, and the second thing is, uh, if otherwise you can always write to us, we'll try and respond to it uh, on mail. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure and honor talking to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for all the interesting details that you have indicated about the study. There's some very interesting findings, I think. Uh, and uh, these findings would should be and uh, would be further on passed on to the to the uh, to the concerned departments and the government departments so that further action or some something comes out of it. So Dr. Talwaza, can I ask you one question? As one of the things important issues that which has come out in this study is a study and one thing which we hadn't discussed as of as of yet, that is the air pollution, both the outdoor and the indoor air pollution. Does it have, uh, in your opinion, your personal opinion, a big or a significant impact on these non-communicable diseases? Because we've seen that even during the COVID, at, uh, in some places, 
no. especially in Italy, there was a study which uh, which pointed out that the mortality was more in um, places which uh, which had more air pollution, had more consistent air pollution. So, uh, can there be a direct link between air pollution and and uh, these developments? Sir? See, uh, Rajesh, your your study clearly shows it. You have done study in more than uh, I mean such a large population. Which clearly shows that uh, pollution is a very important factor, risk factor, whether it is a air pollution or indoor pollution. So no doubt about it. I think uh, we have been mostly looking at uh, lung diseases, is air pollution, cardiac diseases, I think cancer issues. So I think air pollution is a, uh, I mean, your study is very amply highlights. This is one of the important factor, rather one of the most important factor. So I think uh, steps to uh, take care of that, uh, I mean, working on clean environment, both at the outdoor as well as indoor, I think is going to help to reduce this load. Uh, if you permit, Rajesh, I would like to also mention one more area, yes, which your study has again mentioned that in cardiac patients, stress as a most important, again, very, very important risk factor. Actually, right. I think the uh, question is, in stress, it's very difficult to measure. There is no parameter, you know, blood pressure measurement, you know, fatty liver measurement, you know, diabetes measurement. You don't have a measurement for stress because different people have a different attitude to face stress. I think that is the most important. I'll say particularly in younger people and uh, people working in a um, stress is a part of life. Too. If anybody has to grow, he has to face stress. But question is how we can teach or educate the society or youngster to face stress because that's the most important thing. Some people under same stress may crumble down, whereas others may take it as a different challenge. So I think there are a few things. Others needs you are fair in your attitudes and some are religious attitude, particularly sacrifice that if you say, okay, somebody is in trouble, let me help him. So these kind of things, and of course, your religious attitudes, exercise, exercise is another important way to reduce stress. You must have seen that as whenever you are stressed, if you walk down, it becomes less kind of thing. And uh, if you play games, like if you walk, you still keep on thinking in your mind. But if you play, you forget to even think about. So what I mean to say is a kind of uh, activity, kind of uh, exercise, your own attitude. I think they are very helpful way to face the stress today. And I think every, I mean, people, we need to work on more of it to sort of highlight these issues because stress, as I mentioned, is going to be part of life as you grow. You have to face more stress. So I think Thank you so much, Rajesh, um, uh, for this opportunity. And I think it's a very uh, large study that you have come out with uh, addressing such a large population. We have been up till now. I don't think very large, such large studies in the coronary RTD or for hypertension in the country as such. Thank you so much, Rajesh. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your wonderful opinion. And really, uh, the thing that you've talked about stress is very important. And if we were to take this word stress further and in, in, in include the metabolic stress also, that our bodies and our cells face at a microscopic level, then maybe uh, we can try and understand this much better. I would just take this question further on to Dr. Amrish Mittal, sir. So, uh, at times it seems to me that obesity and excess fat, we can say, is to a certain extent the root cause of majority of the NCDs, uh, would it be true, sir, if I say like that? What is your opinion? Dr. Mitchell, are you there? Uh, I think he is not there, so... Dr. Sarin, can I take this question further to you, sir? Dr. Sarin? Sir? Join. Yes, my sir. approach is simple. My approach is simple. When I told you the MAFLD, the metabolic 
dysfunction associated fatty liver disease this is the new term the three limbs of this new term which is now globally being debated are if you are overweight or if you have diabetes you are a risk for your own health metabolic health if you are lean and you have genetic traits like you have high triglyceride or you have uh, you know high ldl and low hdl then you are a genetically so obesity and diabetes in a way are risk factors you go to get your you know hair cut and you see that you have warts or you have the black uh, acanthosis like you just look at when the barber shows you the back of your uh, neck and if you find you have all this you are a high risk factor these are 2020 very clearly shown to be major major things and of course uh, what you ask about obesity obesity is a state of chronic inflammation all the time your body is inflamed so you get more cancers you get more heart disease and therefore obesity is to be avoided and this is because of our own doing it can be prevented I want to say a very small uh, point one more time about SGPT or ALT. In 1990, Korea started with the first study of 1 lakh, like you have done, 1 lakh 90,000 healthcare wor uh, workers who got insurance done. 1 lakh 90. They were followed for 10 years. All those whose SGPT was above 20 they had a risk of slightly more heart disease but much more of liver disease if the sgpt was 80 the heart disease was three times more liver disease was above nine times more as a cause of death so they said sgpt of less than 20 is best for you in india we use sgpt or alt of 40 we at ILBS use less than 30. America uses less than 30 and less than 19 for females. If you want to remain healthy and no NCDs, your SGPT should be less than 20. So today, how do you assess your organs are good or bad? Simply by doing a fibro scan, which is a little ultrasound device you put on the liver. If your liver fat is more than 250, you have 10% and above fat. If your liver is stiff, your heart is stiff. And your SGPT, if it is about 20, it is worrisome. With these small points, we can make a difference. And I would appreciate such large studies as done by you. <coughs> the test of the pudding will be if you can reverse the diseases. And how do we do it? There is a study from New Zealand, 2005, people who lost something like between 30 to 43% weight, 88% their diabetes went away, about 80% hypertension medicines went away, and many, many more liver disease reversed. So weight loss is the best way. So obesity is a risk factor. Weight loss is the biggest and the best treatment we have for non-communicable diseases. So if that can be harnessed, I think we can decrease liver inflammation, body inflammation, fibrosis of organs, and organ failure like CKD or CVD. All these can be prevented by us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'd like to come to Dr. Nanika, sir. So since we are talking about stress and about, uh, uh, about lipids, uh, these are all quite interrelated uh, because of uh, some hormonal changes like cortisol, which may be associated with stress. So, what is your opinion about the ancient Indian practices of yoga and pranayam? Do you think that if uh, incorporated in daily lifestyle in, uh, as a practice, would these help in, over in averting uh, NCDs? Dr. Dhanija, sir. So am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can't see okay. you, but you're. Yeah. So, uh, 
thank you once again. And uh, uh, it's really a landmark study involving 673 public uh, health offices in 21 states. So it's a, one of the largest study we have ever seen amongst the for the NCD in India. So one must compliment, and I'm really happy to be part of this uh, program. So coming back to your question about the uh, Indian uh, system of uh, yoga and other meditation like pranayama and other things. So it is very, very important that the mind, body relaxation, the life work balance, these are important things, not only in increasing the immunity towards the, the infections like COVID-19 or uh, preventing the long-term inflammation inflammations or reversing rather the inflammatory markers. So we have done a study for COVID-19 uh, we did uh, a randomized controlled trial of 250 healthcare workers who were exposed to the COVID-19 patients, and 125 of them were uh, given 28 days of pranayam by the National Institute of Yoga, uh, this Moraji Desai Institute of Yoga, National Institute. And the other 125 were given the normal physical aerobic exercises. And we found to be very, very effective role of pranayam in preventing COVID-19 infections in those healthcare workers who were exposed to the uh, COVID-19 uh, or the SARS-CoV infection. So it is nine to, it was nine to one ratio. So out of 125 who were given pranayam uh, practices for 28 days, only one person that also asymptomatic developed the COVID-19 infections. While in the control arm, there were nine individuals, three of them were symptomatic and six of them were asymptomatic uh, people who developed COVID-19 infections. Uh, that was the difference between uh, the control group as, and and the and the uh, the intervention arm. So thereby, what I mean to say is pranayam, yogic exercises, uh, yoga. They are very very effective. It's not only a physical exercise; it's also a mental exercise that calms your nerves and brings down your uh, risk factor to five. So having said that, I just want to touch upon the preventive aspect. Of what public can do? Those who are listening to this webinar, they must be. Aware that, that a little bit of weight loss, Dr. Uh, Professor Sarin okay, said, no, no. weight loss, a lot of things about weight no, no. loss, yes. I and I'll echo in the same way that weight loss is one of the best treatments available now. Oh, and the recommendation is 10% of weight loss. If you do it voluntarily in six months' time, it can reduce your 30 to 40% of risk of developing lifestyle diseases, whether it is uh, stroke or cardiovascular disease or diabetes or metabolic disease, including the liver one. So that is very, very important. The other thing which I want to touch upon is the role of salt. So if you cut down your salt, that is also very, very beneficial in addition to consumption of a lot of fruits, pellets, vegetables, green vegetables. So if you can change your dietary habits, we are what we eat. That is a very simple statement and we make ourselves as per our diet. Obviously, if we change our diet to increase in the fibers, increase in the the vegetables increase in the fruits at least five servings a day, what we say, and cut down your salt and sugar. So that means we are having a balanced diet that will help in reduction of having a non-communicable diseases. So uh, this was about the public, but coming back to the prevention. So the government of India also has a national but control program now, under the it's National it's Health Mission, which is called the National Program for Control of Cancer, Diabetes, Cardiovascular Disease and Stroke. And that and is very, very effective and it's taking shape now. now. And the government has taken cognizance. So we need to work collectively, whether it is the governmental agencies, whether it is the NGOs, whether it is the industry like SHM and the public at large, civil society. So we have to work as a team to prevent the epidemic of non-communicable diseases in our country, which is seeing a demographic change, as I said earlier. So we need to work upon this. Not only we have to make prevention effectively, we also need to take care of the people who will develop the disease. We need to increase our workforce. For example, we have only 2,000 neurologists in the country. We have only 400 rehab physicians, uh, 1,800 neurosurgeons to scatter to entire 1.3 billion population of India. There are issues like neuro rehabilitation, which is unheard of many, in many states, neuro palliative care, which is a very, very important branch of medicine for a people who have uh, terminal illness or even the the the, the diseases which have uh, limited life span but having a dignified death is very very important and india has ranked 
amongst the bottom of all 200 countries, countries yes, who have a dignified death yes, or a place to die. So uh, I need, we need but to stress uh, upon these factors to not only to improve the quality of life, prevention of cardiovascular disease or non-communicable disease, as well as making infrastructure, strengthening our hospitals and creating platforms to have advanced treatments for these. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dhanija, for this interesting observation. I'd like to uh, come to Shikha, Madam. Dr. Shikha, Dr. Shikha, Dr. Shikha, Dr. Bhagav said, try and do it with the diet and see if it helps. Please, in the female uh, uh, incidence of, uh, of, uh, of uh, oncological diseases in the females. Great. Especially. No, no. I, I, there is some background sound is coming, I think. Hello. Can yes. you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat the question again? Yes, I wanted you to say a few words about the increase in cancer in females. Yeah, I would not say there is an increase in cancer in the females. It is the same increase as in the whole population. Only thing earlier, I think the woman had the least access to a uh, medical facility. And, uh, you know, they were the, uh, you know, so socially they were the most, you know, suppressed. But since now the, they are becoming more empowered and uh, there is a shift of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, cancer in the female. Earlier it used to be when we were, uh, we had started our careers, it was cancer of the service, which was the most common. And, uh, but now the breast cancer has taken over, especially in the metros. Cancer services mostly it's a kind of an infectious cancer where we have poor hygiene and the HPV virus, which is one of the causative factors of carcinoma cervix. And uh, uh, the woman would get married very early, and uh, you know, uh, having uh, uh, more number of children. These are all positive factors of cervix. But now the women have become more educated. They are going to offices. They are marrying late. They are having less number of children. These are again, they are, if they are preventive for carcinoma cervix, but they are uh, the positive factors for breast. So that is why we are seeing the shift in cancer from uterine cervix to. Uh, so basically, it is a change of uh, type of disease in women rather than number of cases. Uh, the and other and also for breast cancers because our lifestyle has changed like our eating pattern has changed we eat more fatty foods people are more fat and uh, um, uh, and uh, use use of red meat and less of fresh vegetables these are all again contributory factors and there is another this thing like in breast cancer there is a role of hereditary cancer. If the mother or the sister or the um, maternal aunts have uh, uh, breast cancer, the uh, the lady in question also have high chance of uh, having a breast cancer. There is a um, uh, genetic marker called BRCA1 and 2. If they're especially if they are there, then there is a very, very high, more than 65% chance of getting a breast cancer. So this is what I can say. There's a, you know, I can't say that there is an increase there is increase in breast cancer in women, but it is a change of type of cancer. But uh, since patient, uh, women are becoming more prominent, more um, you know accessible to healthcare, so that's why the uh, number of cancers are increased. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much. I think we've had a very interesting discussion, very enlightening. Now I would request all the panelists to give a message of prevention uh, to our participants and all our listeners. Uh, Dr. Singh, sir, I would like to start with you. I would request you, even though you said a lot about the causes and uh, about what to disease, what to decrease and change, a few simple message, a uh, few simple tips uh, and message to all our listeners for the prevention of the non-communicable disease. Dr. Singh, sir, are you there? Dr. Singh. Yes, uh, yeah. again, I would come back. Yeah, I'm you. very much there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this has been a very educative session for all of us. And I want to say we diverged into different specialties and branches, thinking that we all can excel. 
the today's session and the the availability of everyone tells you you should now collect together be a complete physician and a cardiologist must know about liver like cardio metabolic a liver guy would say hepato metabolic the surgeries are saying it is a metabolic surgery the surgery is not for obesity so the opportunity of working together one more time as a cohesive group is my first message when you see a patient let's say we see we will say okay also look into the heart or also look into diabetes and the diabetes guy would also try to help the people who have diabetes and cirrhosis you know the cirrhosis is almost two and a half times more in diabetics and a diabetic and obese is four times and very importantly the role of alcohol comes which is you know like increasing like health so if somebody has all these alcohol diabetes obesity then he is gone for a six so we now need to concentrate into simple messages the simple messages of ncd prevention is uh, that we you know do a little bit of outreach try to connect all the threats and second and very importantly is to start it early in the childhood there are very recent data very very recent in science this published i think about 4 weeks ago that the mother should stop feeding the baby maybe late night and try as early as one month to keep the baby not having a feed for 4 to 6 hours this trend is coming what we are saying intermittent fasting can it start for a baby at the age of 1 month and this will prevent development of metabolic syndrome which is the root cause for everything so my message is that right from birth the diet the style the attitude of the parents and of, of course individuals is to be important don't outsource your health invest in yourself and and have a good uh, you know program of dincharya which all of us have stressed and if you want to live 100 years healthy all of us want if you want to live 100 years and healthy keep your sgp around 10 and not at 20 these are my simple messages and i hope you keep repeating similar programs for people and for us also thank you rajesh and thank you sochim thank you so much thank you so much sir thank you so much sir that was really very enlightening and educative for us and for all our participants and all our listeners thank you so much we all try to follow that dr namikya sir i would like to come to you and request you to give forward a message to all our listeners some simple message on what to do and how to keep away from these ncds and live longer as dr sarin said 100 healthy years so my my simple message is that practice a healthy lifestyle so give time to yourself invest in your health do 30 minutes of physical exercise even if it is brisk walking every day at least five time five days a week cut down your salt or or the food with the trans fats or the other thing salt cut down is very very important and think positively and think early think positively and invest in yourself in your own life जीवन की भाग दौड़ में अपने ऊपर भी कुछ समय जरूर इन्वेस्ट कीजिए बिकॉज इवेंचुअली वी आर वट वी ईट एंड वी आर वट वी डू सो ऑब्वियसली डाइट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फिजिकल एक्सरसाइज इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एंड टेक केयर ऑफ योर लाइफ इन ए वे डेट यू हैव ए वर्क लाइफ बैलेंस टू मिनिमाइज द स्ट्रेस लेवल बाई थिंकिंग पॉजिटिवली एंड कंस्ट्रक्टिवली थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच dr shikha what would be your message to our listeners uh mine will not be anything different but i can add that is you eat lot of colorful vegetables and fruits they are all antioxidant uh, they are uh, you know cancer protective not popping pills i will not suggest to uh, take antioxidant as a pill 
but take fresh fruits, take a lot of vegetables like carrots, tomatoes, uh, the, the bell peppers, which are very colorful. This is what my message is. And cut down definitely on the, you know, high sugar uh, diet, high fatty diet, and um, um, <clears throat> the, you know, uh, the red meat. And foremost, mm -hmm. uh, cut out to, uh, tobacco completely. Our country uh, uses betel nuts. Even we, did, I didn't, we didn't mention that, but betel nut is also a big, big contributor for cancer um, cancer um, incidents. And uh, that is what I can say. You can drink in moderation, not in high, but, uh, and of course, if you can avoid uh, Pollution, like going going to polluted place or using masks, that would be a great for lung cancers. That is what I can say. Thank you, and thank you to SHM and thank you, Dr. Kesri. It was a very nice uh, um, uh, program, and I must thank Dr. Koshik, uh, Mr. Koshik Datta, who invited me for this program, and it was first time for me. I think I should be better prepared next time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a wonderful, very interesting, and very nice message. And I thank all our panelists who have given us an immense wealth of information. And every time, every time we gather together, I find uh, something new coming up, some new advice, some new piece of information, which is obviously very informative and very useful for all of, all of us. So much has already been said about non-communicable disease and everyone has reiterated one important thing that these are preventable. So the deaths and the suffering which are caused by non-communicable diseases as we've already seen the heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, uh, liver disease and uh, cancers, respiratory disease, majority of them are preventable with, with our lifestyle, medications with proper care and many of the diseases if they are diagnosed in time like diabetes, hypertension and cancers also and they are treated well, uh, the outcomes are very good and people live in with these diseases with good treatment and management can have a very good quality of life. So screening for these diseases I think is also very important and the epigenetics have been talked about by Dr. Var also that epigenetics also play a very important role, but if uh, we pay proper attention to our dietary habits, to our weight, to our intake, and to our lifestyle, and as Dr. Hamidah had mentioned about yoga and pranayam, these ancient practices which we have inherited, but at times we forget to use them, and the proper dhincharya about which uh, Dr. Sarin has talked about again and again, if we follow all these practices, I'm sure we would be healthy and we'll have a healthy 100 years of life, as Dr. Sarin has mentioned. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, our participants, for being with us. And I'm so thankful to you. I'm also thankful to Mr. Kaushik Datta for preparing this wonderful report. It's a wonderful study which we would all go through in detail. And it has once again brought out uh, in front of all of us the importance of NCDs and how they're affecting us and our lives. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sri, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ramini, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramini, sir. Thank you, Thank you, sir.